Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming here. Uh, I'm going to talk about remote development for local IDEs, obviously. Um, I hope the hypnotic pattern keeps you interested. Uh, anyway, I'm Mark. I'm a software engineer with Typefox, and uh, I'm a project leader at Langium, but I also do a bit of work on Eclipse Sphere, which we're talking today about extensively. So, we're first going to talk about what exactly remote development is. Some of you maybe aren't familiar yet. Um, then we're going to look at who actually employs that, so which IDEs are actually using that. Then how does it actually work, and how do we implement it? And in both topics, we're going to dive a bit deeper into the architectural decisions and patterns behind all of this. Um, you won't see any code. I hope I won't bore you with that, but we'll go quite deep in architectural design. All right, so what is it, in a few words? Um, Let's take an example. So for, um, let's say my company only gave me a Chromebook, not a real developer machine, and I'm strapped for resources right now, but I want to develop some kind of Java, Tomcat, Spring server, um, but I don't really have the resources right now, and, well, I still have my tests to finish, right? So what I do is I rent some EC2 instance on AWS, and connect to it somehow. I upload my code, I upload all my, or download all my resources like uh, debuggers and, and maybe a Java compiler, whatever. But I still need to somehow connect to it, right? I, I, I don't want to go to back to primitive times, uh, I don't know, editing my, code, editing my code with Vim or whatever. Instead, I actually want to use a real IDE and connect to the remote machine through remote development. And that's exactly what it's for, right? So I, I want to edit and run my code as if it were local. And so that's what remote development is supposed to accomplish. So looking at a few features of it, uh, first off, of course, in this case, we have terminals. Um, I have a Windows 11 window here showing VS Code connected to um, a GitPub machine in, I believe, Google Cloud. And it, uh, even though it's a Windows 11 window, it runs Ubuntu uh, in a terminal. And so I have all Ubuntu commands available for me. I'm logged in as a user Git pod in the workspace, in the FIA workspace, and I'm able to just work on the Git pod workspace, even though it's running uh, somewhere in the cloud, if it were just locally. I have all my navigator available and so on. And then, of course, I also want to edit code. I do have full language support in there, right? So I do have, want to have all my completions. I, I want the the back end or whatever IDE I have to analyze my code and give me all the language support that I need to actually perform my, my tests. Um, of course, connected to that, I also have debugging. So I want to, for example, in this case, debug my FIA backend application and um, step through the code step by step, looking at each variable and so on. And then, of course, we have port forwarding, uh, which is of course interesting for the example I gave. I'm writing some Java backend system, for example, and uh, maybe my machine is quite locked off. I have a strong firewall or something. I don't have any HTTP access to it. Uh, I only have some rudimentary SSH access on port 22, and everything else is just inaccessible to me. And so what we do with port forwarding is that even though I don't have actual HTTP access to my machine, I can forward all my remote ports that are open to my local host. And so, for example, in this case, I have uh, on port 3000 my FIA application running. And if I go to localhost 3000, I would be able to actually run the application and see the application running on the local host, even though the server is actually, well, somewhere in the cloud. Right, and so now that we've got that out of the way, um, who actually offers support for remote development? And there are actually just a few select IDEs. For one, obviously, I've just shown VS Code quite a lot. It's VS Code. They've been offering it since 2018 or something, quite a long time, and the architecture is quite sophisticated for that. Um, then there's also another major player, obviously, which is JetBrains, um, and they've recently launched JetBrains Gateway, which allows to uh, any user to just load up any uh, SSH server and, and connect to it, and then use stuff like IntelliJ IDEA or WebStorm um, using remote development, so connecting to a remote workspace and doing all the things you, you want to do. Uh, and then we also have Labs, um, which is there in the middle. Uh, it's currently in pre-alpha stage. It's, it's quite a new one. It's an open-source Rust-based IDE. 
um, but it also supports uh, remote development, and we will go into more in depth on both VS Code and Labs regarding its architecture, uh, because they're both open source and they both explain how the architecture actually looks like. I have no idea how the JetBrains gateway architecture looks like because they never explain it anywhere, and it's obviously not open source. All right. So, um, and one more interesting tidbit um, and a small announcement, basically. Uh, so, coming soon, every fear application if they choose to, can actually run remote development as well. And we will take a look how we accomplish that, as, that at all later. So first off, how do classical IDEs actually work or look from, from an architectural overview? So of course, we're running on a local OS. We have our Windows, our Mac, our Ubuntu machines, and all of our resources that we actually want to access, stuff like source code and our running application, terminal processes, and our debugger, actually is all local. So it's quite easy to access that using traditional means. And so our application is kind of monolithic usually in this case. So um, even though you might have something like an Eclipse IDE with OSGI plugins, it still runs as kind of one system, one process. And of course, everything's embedded in that. So you have UI features, stuff like um, that I'd like to differentiate here in UI and workspace features. So UI features are stuff like theming and key bindings and stuff like that, and preferences. Things that are only really interesting for the front end of your application, but don't really are related to what you're actually working on. And then, of course, you have the other side, the workspace features. Things that actually need the code that you want to run. Stuff like a debugger, stuff like language support. Things that... Um, just require workspace, otherwise it just won't work. Right, and both of these are just embedded in a single monolithic app. So I've taken this diagram basically straight from the VS Code um, documentation, and we will soon explain why it's not good, but or at least not why it doesn't show the full picture, but it makes sense for now, and it gives us quite good overview, actually, because what we basically do is um, we have now a split backend and front end. We basically, on the front end side, we just have UI features. We install just our local VS Code instance that runs on our local OS. And then we've introduced a split, where in this case, we have an SSH tunnel that connects to a new instance of VS Code, which is in this case the VS Code server that you can also run standalone as a server application. But in this case, it basically acts as um, a gateway to our uh, remote resources. Because for the VS Code server instance, which runs on the remote machine, these remote resources are just local resources. They look just remote to us. And so they have the, the, the remote instance now has access to all the, these resources just as if it were local. And that's really tr the trick behind it. And now we just need some way to connect our local VS Code instance via the SSH tunnel to the remote instance and get our workspace features through there. All right. You will notice little difference in uh, how Labs actually does the same feature because it's kind of the same, really. Um, so we have two components, the Labs UI and the Labs proxy, and they accomplish kind of the same goal. This, uh, Slide isn't interesting by itself, but the next slide is. Because what Labs is actually doing is that even on the local OS, you have the same split between Labs UI and the Labs proxy. And that's actually quite nice, because the only thing that's really different when you're running in a remote use case is that you exchange the communication layer between the Labs UI and the Labs proxy component. So for one, you have, I don't know, something like in, inter Interprocess communication, something like ICP, uh, ICP, IPC, yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, just in the remote case, you have something like uh, SSH. It's quite simple, but that actually led us to a nice idea when we're working with Thea later on. So we can abstract both of these ideas that VS Code and Labs have introduced to basically create an abstract template to remote design. So for one, we have our IDE workspace uh, front end that only contains UI features. And then we have a separate IDE backend that runs on the remote machine that we just connect to via some sort of tunnel, usually SSH, but can be really anything. All right. And now let's apply this template to fear. 
So fear is really kind of two or three applications. It really depends on how you look at it. But um, first off, we have the in, in the electron use case at least, where we have a desktop app. Um, we actually have a single entry point into the application, which is the Electron main application. And it gets started by the Electron entry point, and um, then it actually starts two other processes. So for one, we have the IDE backend, which gets just started on some random port. And then we have all the FIA front ends, so each individual window, which then connects to the backend using the port that we have gener randomly generated. All right. And then we just instruct basically two of these components using the Electron main app, and that's the whole IDE running. OK, let's apply the template that we have using fear. So we introduce a split. We just say we have a tunnel, and we connect our fear front end through this tunnel to our ID backend. Unfortunately, it's not that easy because, well, our fear front end is just that. It's just a JavaScript front end application. It's not really capable of actually creating this sort of tunnel, especially not when working with SSH, which is a really low-level protocol. So we can't easily create this sort of tunnel. We instead have to create an IDE proxy, actually. And this is basically just the local IDE backend acting as a proxy for the backend, which is then copied. So how it basically works is that we take our local IDE, copy it to the backend, uh, to the remote machine, Exodus, Exodus via SSH, and then we somehow get the same features out of it. Obviously, that sounds quite easy. Um, so in the last slide that I will show you now, and this will take a few minutes, um, I will explain how this SSH tunnel mechanism actually works. Because as I mentioned, VS Code omits quite a lot of things. And this makes sense for brevity, because they want just their users to generally show how things work. But we really want to dive into it. And well, we, we want to implement it, right? So um, that brings us to this slide. So first off, we have our local OS. It starts this application. We have the Electron main. We have the fear front end. We have the local IDE back end, which acts as the IDE proxy in this case. And we have a remote machine which in, with an SSH server running. All right. So first things first, we need to connect by SSH. And we also use SFTP, which is just a secure file transfer protocol that we need to actually copy our appli remote application. Every adopter of FIA has their own backend, their own small, as Matthew likes to call it, paint on top of FIA. And so um, we can't just use a generic FIA backend. We have to use the actual backend that's currently running on the user system. And so um, we use this backend copy, copied over via SFTP, and just start it up on some random port. In this case, the random port is accidentally 6,000. And um, this backend copy now has access to all of our remote resources, right? We have all our source code available there, our debuggers, and so on. All right, that's quite good. We now somehow need to connect to it, because basically our fear front end doesn't have an easy connection to the remote machine, because we generally assume that it doesn't have any HTTP ingress, right? So we need some other way to connect to it. In comes the SSH for port forwarding server. So a little known feature of SSH is that it actually allows port forwarding. So what you do is that you create a lo new local proxy server on your local machine and assign some random port. And then you tell SSH or your SSH client to forward this port, in this case on the local host 5000, to forward all messages that it gets to, lo uh, to the local host, host 6000 on the remote machine. So basically all as HTTP or I believe even TCP messages that are received on lo uh, local port 5000 now get sent directly to the remote machine on local port 6000, which is coincidentally exactly our port that was opened on the remote machine for our IDE backend copy. All right. And of course, the same thing goes in reverse direction as well. Any, any message that the IDE backend copy wants to send back also gets received on the proxy server, which then sends it back to the fear front end. And basically, at this point, we want to have two connections kinds. For one, um, we want to have 
somehow access to our remote machine and all of its resources. So we want the navigator to get the source code, we want our debugger to find the, the actual debug application that it needs to, to, to run. And so um, we have a lot of connections that go through this proxy server to our ID backend. However, we have actually a second set of services that require our local backend. Not only because, for example, there are things that we want to keep local, like our preferences, that we actually well, don't want simply to copy over, but actually want to keep local. Uh, but also since we actually might have multiple windows open currently right now, and we don't want all of them to actually connect to the remote backend. We only want one window to, to work on the remote backend, and all others actually keep on the local backend. So it still needs to work as a full uh, IDE backend. OK. And then we actually have the SSH tunnel. So there's quite a lot more going on uh, instead of just the small um, well, label on there. And then there's actually one more thing that happens in here, which is uh, our CDN. Because uh, what we've been working on recently is, well, this whole thing, in, just in general. And um, it's been quite a lot of work uh, getting it into fear. But uh, one thing that has been bothering us the whole time was that every time we needed to test this feature, we needed to upload our whole IDE backend um, via SFTP to the remote machine. And this took quite a long time. Uh, even though I have something like a 100 megabyte upload, um, SFTP isn't actually capable of transferring this kind of data, in, in this speed at least. So it took me like one or two minutes every time to upload um, the whole backend. And users will actually see the same issue especially if they're on a slower network connection. And so what we came up with was an idea that we actually took from VS Code, because they're doing the very sim uh, same thing. They actually never copy the local system over to the remote system, but they instead directly use the remote system to download from some sort of CDN. And then, well, they can make use of their fast network connection that might be on their cloud system, for example, like in, in Google Cloud or AWS. Right. And that actually brings us slowly but surely to the end. Um, we have a bit of a roadmap ahead of us, actually. The feature still isn't merged, so that comes first. But I had hoped, actually, that it will be merged by now. So it isn't on here. Um, anyway, so first off, we have the download from CDNs. Um, this is quite important, and we will work on that in the near future. And then there are quite a few things which are still uncertain. Um, the work we've been doing as Typefox um, has been mostly concerned with stuff I've been talking about. And um, some things just aren't, well, we, we haven't been looking at working on these yet. And we really don't know whether we actually will. But things like these are actually very important. Because I've mentioned um, remote port forwarding is one of the key features that makes remote development great. And so that's one thing that we definitely want to have in there as well. As well as two other things, which um, are working in, in VS Code as well as separate extensions, meaning um, the Windows subsystem, subsystem for Linux, as well as the dev container support, where you either connect to a running um, system of, of Linux on your own Windows machine, and have that as, a, as your local backend base, or as your remote machine uh, in this architecture, or uh, as a dev container, where you basically spin up uh, a, a Docker container, and then use that as your remote machine, even though you cannot really say they're remote machines because they're kind of on your local system. But these things are very much uncertain, so we'll, we're very much interested in, in sponsoring and so on to, to, to work on these things. All right, and that brings us actually to the end. I hope you, were, you had an interesting deep dive into well, a small feature of, of Thea and its architecture, and I'm open for questions. Matthew. All right, so the question was whether we can actually enable collaboration through this sort of feature. Um, I don't actually think so. So right now, Thea actually has the, um, the browser use case in mind as well, right? So, and um, 
really, this, this thing isn't really too different from the existing browser use case where you have a remote machine that starts up a server and then is available through, S, uh, through, through HTTP. And the only difference being the, the sort of SSH workaround we do on the local machine. And so since the collaboration support isn't there yet for, for the browser use case either, we don't really can use this for, for the SSH support, unfortunately. Yeah. Yet, exactly. Next up. All right, so the question is why we actually need to have things other than this play from the actual IDE running on the local system. Okay, so for one, um, one thing that is like shortly touched on during the presentation was that you can have multiple windows of fear running at the same time, right? So you want to have maybe work on multiple workspaces at the same time, whatever. And um, all of these access the same backend locally, at least in the Electron use case. And so from a pure technical perspective, you at least need this, like, still kind of a fallback for these windows that don't really access the remote backend, right? So we have two windows, one access the remote backend, one still uses the local system, and this one front end that still uses the local system requires the use of a local backend. And then we basically just also have these services that, as a second thought, basically, we have these uh, services that basically are can, are need to be purely local, stuff like um, theming information or stuff like key bindings, which we want to keep on the local machine, usually at least. We, we can copy them over in theory, but generally we want to use the same key bindings on the, on the local system as on the remote machine. And so instead of copying them over using some complicated process, we instead use the local backend to, to gather the information that we, that we have on our system already. Thomas. How does it work with uh, cross platform Good question. <laughs> so Thomas asked how the um, how we actually transport the, the local backend or the, the backend copy over uh, like to to a different OS, right? So um, let's say for example, I've mentioned earlier I work on um, a Windows machine usually and then I copy or use use Ubuntu as a remote machine. So FIA uses a lot of uh, native dependencies that are compiled for the local target system. So let's say, for example, I download an instance of um, a Windows app for FIA, then I get the native dependencies for FIA, and I can't easily use those um, on the remote machine. And what we do is actually that we have a copy of all these native dependencies um, on GitHub for each, um, for each OS. And so during the copy process, we actually just look up which OS we are copying to, download the rest of these native dependencies, which are just a megabyte or two, just a small zip, and um, put it into the existing backend and then move it over. So we really have just a small overhead of, of downloading and copying a few extra files instead of needing to, to basically download the whole um, backend specific for, the, uh, yeah, for a specific OS. A lot of questions. Okay, please. <laughs> um, what if the network connection breaks? Is there the ability to reconnect to the existing workspace and primary processes there on the debugging sessions and what was Not yet. Um, and right now, when the, so the question was that uh, when the network connection can, uh, somehow breaks, uh, we, whether we have the ability to somehow reinstate any, any kind of state, so debuggers and whatever. So right now we don't. Um, it, it's, it's a general issue in fear per se, basically, even on the, for example, in the browser mode, when you reload the window or just lose connection in general and then reinstate the connection, um, you basically lose any kind of state that you have stored on the local front end connected to the back end. So, Unfortunately, right now, you lose everything, kind of, except, of course, for the changes that you have done to your, modif uh, like the modifications you've done to the workspace. So, but everything else is kind of lost because all, all the terminal processes die and so on. All right, 
Right. So, okay. So the, the the question was, since we currently just copy our local backend to the remote system, um, could we, in theory, inject malicious code in there as well? Yes, <laughs> that's a real possibility. There's currently no like checksum mechanism or whatever that validates against this kind of malicious attack. So that would be a real, a really good idea to have something like this because right now, um, all of this is kind of in a in a POC state. Uh, but right now, if if the local like IDE backend detects an instance of the backend copy on the remote system, it will just use that without confirming that it's the correct instance, basically. So it could, in theory, use any kind of system that's accidentally available under the correct path, um, which could be maliciously injected, yes, and then accidentally get I don't know some forged information back. Yeah, that could happen. Yep, that, that could happen. All right, I believe, right, thank you. Yep. Okay. All right, so the question was, what are the requirements on the remote machine, actually, for in order to run this? Um, so what the IDE backend does is um, it downloads a copy of Node, actually, uh, like Node.js, onto the remote machine in case it's not available, um, so that it definitely has a Node version at least, so it can actually start the backend since it's all just JavaScript. And um, everything else is basically what FIA actually needs itself to run. So you need a somewhat current version of whatever, like Ubuntu or Mac or whatever. Uh, I believe it supports Ubuntu 2004, but that comes down to what kind of native dependencies we actually uh, download. So. Um, but generally, everything that can run fear can also run the fear like backend copy in here. All right, I believe we are coming to the end anyway to, of the time. So that was a lot of questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> and. Uh,